All right. Hello, everyone. If you're here for the landscape conversion webinar, you're in the right place. Um, we'll get started in about a minute or so. Just give everyone some time to log into the Zoom. All right. So welcome again, everybody. This is the Landscape Conversion 101 webinar um, presented by Juanita. And um, it's hosted by the city of Palo Alto as well as the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Just some housekeeping for um, the webinar tonight. Um, all of the attendees are muted by default. Um, Q&A will be held after Juanita's presentation. So if you have any questions throughout, please um, enter your questions into the Q&A box. You can find it just um, on the control panel at the bottom of your um, screen within the Zoom application. Um, we will moderate the questions at the end and Juanita will answer them then. Um, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available to you afterwards. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who is registered um, with the link to the recorded webinar, along with any of the resources that we mention throughout the presentation, as well as links to the rebate programs we have to offer. And I just want to mention that if you are a Palo Alto resident, to please stay until the very end because we will be going through all of the landscape rebates as well as stormwater rebates that are available to you. So a little bit about Bosca. Um, Bosca represents 26 agencies throughout the Bay Area, all who are serviced by the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Um, they provide water um, to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses. Um, Bosca's goal is high, high quality supply of water and at a fair price. So Bosca offers um, rebates as well, um, more for San Mateo County residents. So if that is you, please listen up right now. Um, primarily, these programs are for outdoor water use, similar to our landscape rebates that we offer Palo Alto residents. Bosca has the Lawn Be Gone program, which is a landscape conversion uh, rebate, as well as a $200 rebate for rain barrel installations. They also have a smart controller rebate, um, as well as a rain garden rebate. Um, so if you are in San Mateo County or any of the Bosca agency territories outside of the city of Palo Alto or Santa Clara County, please visit their website to get more information about the rebates available to you. Um, this is also a list of upcoming webinars that Bosca is hosting. Um, you can find this in all of the registration links on their website. And they also have this resource available um, to everyone, it's uh, the bayareagardening.org website where you can get information about plants and um, resources um, when you're looking to uh, convert your lawn to a drought tolerant landscape. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Juanita now and she's gonna start her presentation. And like I mentioned, this will be recorded and available to you afterwards. And we will be discussing more about um, Palo Alto residents rebates that are available to you at the end after the Q&A. All right, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Juanita. Thanks, Shelby. All right, let me uh, open this up. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming and listening to what I have to say tonight. I'm talking about landscape conversion and how to uh, convert your uh, your own home garden into something that's going to be uh, friendly to uh, the environment. Um, I am um, <clears throat> a landscape architect 
And I also have a PhD in biopsychology, which I, uh, when I was a graduate student, I studied eating and drinking um, and the physiology thereof. So <clears throat> now when I do these gardens, um, I see them as sort of a coming full circle on the, uh, on the two disciplines because the way that uh, plants function in the landscape is food. Um, we do have some gardens in Palo Alto to visit, so you can take a look to see these particular plants, um, how they look in the, in the uh, landscape. Um, I do a lot of macro photography and, and photography in general to document species that I see. Um, if you want, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden or our YouTube channel, Primrose Way. Like I said, we have five gardens here in Palo Alto. And they're always open, they're um, on public spaces. And so we have um, the uh, Primrose Garden, uh, Arcadia Place, Island Drive, Hopkins Avenue, and uh, the Gwenda Street uh, Pollinator Garden in Palo Alto. This is Embarcadero Road here, um, this is Channing Avenue. Pretty easy to find too, you can Google uh, Pollinator Garden Palo Alto and those will uh, show up on Google Maps. Okay, uh, the overview of what I'm talking about tonight. Um, so as a designer, I'm all about function. And so I try to do function-based design. I always have a reason for what I'm doing. Um, we're going to define some terms. We're going to talk about the benefits of th this particular method. Um, how to do measurement in your yard and placement of things, planting, and then uh, some maintenance issues. So getting to function, uh, you probably heard the expression form follows function. So the question to ask yourself is how are you going to use your area? Um, what you want to do is when you're thinking about your landscape, list the functions for the spaces that you want. This helps you organize your spaces. Think of spaces as rooms where you have hallways, walls, and floors. Okay, the floor being the ground, of course, walls being fences, um, and the outsides of buildings, and the sky being the ceiling. And then once you have your wish list, kind of, you know, see how these spaces relate to each other so you can kind of get an idea about how function relates to each other. Ask yourself, is this size big enough for this? You know, am I going to have 100 people over for a barbecue? Is this space going to need a larger dining area and so forth? And then you kind of look at the flow between those areas and get the whole idea of the movement between those areas. And this helps you start to build a structure that you can uh, then design around. And while you're doing this, think about ways uh, function can reduce irrigation and water use in the landscape, such as having a rain garden. So uh, consider installing a pool or removing an existing pool that you might have. Um, so this was a, a design I did. Uh, this was in Atherton. And as you can see, this before picture over here, there's um, just the whole yard is being used by the pool. Um, afterwards, the homeowners remove the pool and they have a lot of space to spread out now. They've got their lounges out, they've got their fire pit and a fraction of the water use that they used before. And now they can enjoy the space all year long. So a better function, definitely. Um, now, outdoor water um, accounts for most of a home's water use. Lawns can use up to, um, let's move this over here, um, can use up to 50% um, of outdoor water use. So that's a lot. And when you're designing, use, again, function-based decision-making. What are lawns used for? Okay, so this is another design I did. You can see where everybody is congregating over on the patio with one person using the lawn. So what are lawns used for? Think about uh, ways to maybe not have a lawn. Um, and if you do a lawn, you could maybe use a native grass mix that uses about a third as much water. But um, 
you know, again, what is the function of the area? What is a rain garden? A uh, rain garden is an area that receives rain from the rooftops or other surfaces. And rain gardens, they're not intended to store water. We're not building ponds here, but it provides an area that allows the water to soak quickly into the soil and just and recharge the underground aquifers. And this is actually the uh, rain garden at the Lucy Stern Center in Palo Alto. And you can see the parking area slopes into the center area where there's planting. An efficient use of the parking area, I think. Um, some of the benefits of rain gardens. Um, water soaking into the ground is filtered and cleaned by plant roots. Water flowing over a surface like a street or a sidewalk or a driveway may pick up uh, petrochemicals, antifreeze, trash, whatever. Um, and when those that water flows over ground um, in the street, it flows down into the storm drain and um, is those pollutants go there. Um, rain gardens, if you decide, if you design them well and install them well, they can be really attractive features in the residential landscape. They become a really nice feature because um, they're very decorative, but they also have this great function. Um, and they provide these wonderfully unique opportunities to enhance biodiversity. Um, if they're done well, of course, uh, you can use less water in the landscape and then you can save money. So it's like a cost saving solution. And if you're wanting to change your plants out to native plants, but don't know where to start, this is a good way to start. Decide that you want to start with a rain garden and uh, go from there. Where does water flow? And I have to admit, when I was a student in landscape architecture, I did not know there was a difference between what happens with the sanitary sewers and then the storm drains. Um, I never really paid any attention, um, but we do have these two different places where liquid things go. Um, the sanitary sewer is where our, the effluent from toilets, dishwashers, bathtubs, sinks, and so forth go, and that's that gets treated. And then we have a storm drain, um, which is over, uh, over streets and sidewalks and other impervious surfaces. And these are two separate systems. Okay, we don't want them to intermingle at all. They are very separate. So, you know, again, what I meant before about rain gardens having this uh, ability to enhance uh, biological diversity, um, you can enhance the connectivity and the complexity in the landscape. And the more that you connect things and the higher the complexity, plants support each other in the garden when they are in a community of plants. They, and when they're in the community, they share water underground. Um, and that also leads to reduced irrigation needs. You know, people say, well, maybe I shouldn't plant so many things. Actually, you want to plant more things because more plants will share resources. They communicate underground via the mycorrhiza network underneath the soil, um, and they will share nutrients and water. So where do we put these uh, rain gardens? Well, we have a handy checklist of, of ingredients here for where these things go. We uh, want to have a minimum distance of 10 feet from building foundations. Don't want moisture up against your, your building. Uh, the deepest part uh, of the garden should be a minimum of, of five feet from property lines and then three feet from a public sidewalk. We don't want the water to flow onto a neighbor's property. Full sun if possible, part sun otherwise. Outside of the tree canopy, um, if you can, Otherwise, try to avoid the large roots, you know, be flexible in your design that way. You want to avoid underground utilities, so call 811 before you dig and they will come in for free and mark out the placement of utilities if you're not sure where things are. Um, <clears throat> you don't want these things on top of a, a septic tank or a leach field, if that is something that you have, or any sort of underground structures. There should be an area that the garden, the rain garden can overflow if we have 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Um, and 
you want that downslope of the rain garden and it should not flow directly into a creek or a natural waterway. So it could um, maybe flow into a storm drain or maybe into another rain garden. A relatively flat site or a concave area is, is pretty good. And lastly, every place is slightly different. So if you're not in Palo Alto, and if you are in Palo Alto, check your local codes. Those are online, pretty easy to check. Just you want to be sure that you're not uh, missing any uh, helpful regulations. So how large to make the rain garden? Okay, a rule of thumb is that the rain garden should be about 20% of the size of the area draining into it. So what I like to do when I'm just doing a quick design for people, I don't have a, a site survey. Um, I'll take an aerial photograph like this one here um, from Google Earth or whatever, and I will draw over the top of that. <clears throat> And I mark out where the, um, the property line is, that's that dash line there. And then, are you ready for it? Find the downspouts, look at how the roof is to see uh, the area that's draining. Here's a downspout, there's a downspout. And so um, this is a good location then for this particular garden. Um, so, if you want to use site measuring um, to really get a nice accurate map, what I like to do when I go out on site, if I don't have a nice site survey prepared for me already, I will take graph paper out to the site. I'll pull a, a soft tape, one that you reel out, um, and pull it against the house to get a nice straight line, a baseline to measure from, and then I'll pull another tape um, in the other direction, and then I'll measure and it, it's very helpful to have squares on these papers, graph papers, because one square can equal one foot. And so you transpose your measurements straight onto the graph paper, super easy. Um, it takes time, of course, but uh, it's just a really good way to generate a base map that you can use right after you make it. Um, and you want to take inventory of things. Um, you know, want to know where your trees are, where the edges of the, any lawn are, any hardscape like patios or walkways, downspouts, utilities, any existing lighting, electrical outlets, wh where the building is. This is the house uh, that I measured in the back here, where doors and windows are, any sort of notable features that are there. This was the retaining wall that went over uh, the backyard. And you also want to make note of which way north is. So easy way to measure your yard. Always have a good to map to scale when you're designing something. It'll make your life much easier. Once you're done um, with the measurement, um, you want to overlay the site measurements with translucent tracing paper. Um, and very generally show those functional areas for activities, those movements between areas, and then planting areas. So. Um, Remember that functional diagram, remember form follows function. So fire pit, dining, cooking, um, here's the door to the outside, here's another door, a slider. And so what's the circulation look like? This is a very general kind of um, site-based functional diagram and just kind of showing where those functions make sense in the environment. And then the green showing where vegetation could happen, okay? so. Um, very easy to kind of get a sense of that. Quick design tip for you guys. Um, the landscape architect of me comes out here. Um, so what makes a design look professional? So the things that make designs look professional is you consider your overall composition, consider relationships between the shapes that you're using, your patios. Um, you know, do things, do circular areas line up? with rectangular areas, are they on an axis? Okay, so these are design tricks that I thought I would share with you. So um, one thing that you want to use, arcs and tangents, you know, nice big arcs, no random kind of uh, wishy-washy curves. You wanna use nice strong curves, avoid those acute pizza pie shaped angles because those are maintenance nightmares. And then to harmonize the composition, repeat elements, okay? So like um, these two smaller squares are a version of the larger square. So it's the same element, but repeated at a different scale. Okay, and that's four years of landscape architecture right there. 
Um, once you decide on kind of your forms that you want, flop over another piece of tracing paper over the top of your functions and then create some shaped areas. Remember, form follows function. This particular client wanted something sort of linear. And so that was actually pretty easy. The fire pit area gets its little bump out there because we're going to do some couches. Um, we got rid of the retaining wall and made some steps down. We put the dining area. So once you have your forms then and you know where the people go, then you um, your trees first. Okay, and you want to show those very sort of uh, uh, generally. Throw another piece of tracing paper on the top there. Um, you can see there's the trees and you can still see through it. That's the great thing about translucent paper. But then you want to think about shrub masses. OK, um, and that's another quick and easy way to kind of get a general idea about where things go. Measure your furniture again using graph paper. This is a quarter scale graph paper. You can see there's a one quarter inch there. Super easy to then make cutouts if you have the same size graph paper and move things around and make sure things fit. That's what the refined concept looks like, OK? Um, your results may differ, but, um, you know, again, form following function. There's a function for dining, um, a function for the fire pit, um, for cooking, and so forth. Now, when we're doing rain gardens, um, we want to direct water from the downspouts away from your building. You can use splash blocks, okay? Um, and then you can have gravel in the swale. And the swale is the linear channel that directs water to the deepest part of the rain garden just to prevent erosion, OK? If you don't want a splash block, um, you can pipe those downspouts underground um, in pipes. And then they can have outlets actually in the rain garden itself. You don't need a swale. Um, and you want the outlet and kind of the more shallower area so water can then flow down to the deeper part. Shape. Shape is really up to you. Um, you know, again, this was a, a design that I did and this was installed by a professional contractor who did a great job. And there are lots of possibilities for shape. You can do oval, round, kidney shaped. The things, see what fits for that particular area. Remember, you're gonna have about 20% of the area that you're draining into that area. So you want it to be big enough to take that water. Um, in this garden, the existing planting bed that was there was taken out, all the plants removed, and then we converted it to a rain garden with grasses and some little perennials and shrubs on the side. And so the shape kind of mirrors the shape of the bed and it worked out perfectly. Um, and even though it's a dry garden, water isn't there all year round, it's still very attractive because we have larger cobbles and smaller cobbles there that, that make it really have a lot of visual interest. Um, in general, you want to avoid large tree roots. And with this client, we had a patio that was actually, the grade was raised up and so it created a natural low point. And we took advantage of that um, to create um, a little rain garden. So their downspouts empty out over here, they pipe underground. And it was a very narrow channel going down to the rain garden area here to the low spot. Um, the contractor worked with an arborist. These are redwood trees. Generally, you don't wanna have a rain garden under trees that don't want saturated soil. Redwoods are an exception. They don't mind lots of water. They like lots of water. And the soil here was very sandy loam. So good infiltration with the soil. Um, and so not really uh, an issue here with this tree. The homeowners love it. Another picture of this showing the swale here going down to the rain garden area. Um, and this should be sloped slightly to get the water to run away from where the water is coming in at a 2% slope. That is a quarter inch per foot away from the building then down. And as you can see that it's a very gentle, it almost looks flat, but trust me, it's not. Um, and the sides of it, you want to be 
very gently sloped. You don't want it to be a ditch where the sides are like really steep, something very shallow because you want to direct the water down the center of it. Um, and this will decrease the amount of erosion that goes on. Um, decorative boulders on either side, again, provide lots of visual interest. The homeowners love this particular design. Their favorite part of the garden, actually. Now the depth, how deep do you make this thing? The Bay Area Stormwater Management Agencies Association recommends a depth of six inches across the bottom. So the bottom should be relatively flat um, so that the water can spread out and then sink in. Um, if you have something that's deep with steeper sides, that potentially could hold water longer, um, inviting mosquitoes and other pests. We want, we want to avoid that. So a nice flat bottomed area where water can sink in and be dispersed within a day or so, that's what you want. And that way you can avoid mosquitoes. Here's a, you know, talking about soil considerations. We have lots of different soil types here in Palo Alto, everything from clay soils, which will hold water to uh, wonderful sandy loamy soils. What, uh, what your soil is like. Um, do a test. First, dig a hole. Uh, dig a hole uh, to test for infiltration. And, um, you know, a foot deep and wide should be enough. Fill it with water three times to let it really saturate. So mimicking a rainfall event. And then the fourth time, fill that hole up and time it. How long does it take for the water to soak in? Okay, if you have water that's standing over a day or two later, you know that you've got some clay soil. And so you're gonna to need to loosen and amend the soil at the deepest part of the rain garden to improve infiltration if you need to, okay? Um, and the sandy loamy soils definitely drain so much faster than clay soils, but you can amend those clay soils um, to uh, uh, enhance infiltration. <clears throat> what to plant? Now that you've designed everything, you've got your concepts of where plants maybe should go. It's like, how do you decide what to plant? And this is how the plants are how you get the biological diversity. Okay. Um, I recommend everybody go to calscape.org to find plants. Um, this is done by the California Native Plant Society. <clears throat> it's a searchable database gives you lots of information and resources about how to plant, uh, where to find plants. Um, you can research the plants that qualify for those rebates. And from those plants, then you start to create your plant palette of trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, vines, and succulents. California has a lot of plants, 7,990. So there is a plant for every situation, literally. Um, wonderful resource that the California Native Plant Society provides for free. Now, a better question, I think, is to, instead of planting things, plants are food. And so I always ask myself, who do you feed? And so here in California, we have 1,368 species of butterflies and moths. Why is that important? Because those, those insects, their larvae feed upon the plants. And that's how we get butterflies and moths. But those larvae are excellent food for birds and baby birds especially. And that's uh, how you get more baby birds as they eat a lot of caterpillars. Um, we know that when you have pollinators like bees, for example, and what bees do in the environment is they spread genes around <clears throat> and the genes of the plants then um, are diverse and a lot of things then can come and eat those, eat those plants. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that we know about plants when they have their genes moved around by bees is that speciation of plants is much more rapid when they're actually moved around by pollinators. And that tells us then that biology then becomes a really important factor when you're trying to determine what to plant, okay? Even probably more so than climate 
geology, and water when you try to determine what to plant. Ask yourself, what kinds of organisms do you want to support in the environment? And when you start supporting organisms in the environment, you make a much more resilient, biodiverse um, ecosystem, and it's better for everything. All right, where's my cursor? There it is. All right, <clears throat> how much water you do, how can I find out how much water plants use? Um, you know, people talk about low water use plants, high water use plants, but what does that actually mean? Well, there's a resource online. Um, the water use classification of landscape species is a searchable database, and there's a live link here um, for that. And they rank plants, low, very low, low, medium, and high, based on a percentage of how much water turf grass uses. So one equals turf grass, okay? Um, very low uh, use plants, like 10% 10 per 10 of turf grass. So super low. Um, interestingly enough, they have swimming pools equaling turf grass. So another reason to really reconsider those swimming pools. How do you lay out the plants when you once you have them? Um, I always like to put in pathways first in the planting areas for maintenance, and then take plants from that plant palette um, and show them as circles at their mature diameter. Again, use your graph paper so that you know that you've got your circles the right size. And most of the uh, plants uh, should be overlapping. Some, some can go underneath, especially if you have a tall vase-shaped shrub. There's lots of space underneath to plant. Um, start with trees, then your shrubs, and then layer in the small stuff, the perennials, the vibes, the bulbs, the succulents, and annuals. So, and remember to plant things underneath uh, tall trees and shrubs. Why native plants? Well, California is a biodiversity hotspot, one of about 30 on the planet. We have almost 8,000 species of plants here in California, some found nowhere else on the planet. We have more plant species than any other state in the United States. We have 1,600 species of native bees, more than any other state in the United States. Uh, across the United States, there are 4,000 species spreading genetic diversity. Um, honeybees, not native, we don't need to talk about them. What we wanna talk about are the native pollinators. Um, and we have such unique ecosystems in California um, with unique plants because of those pollinators and because of the unique um, areas. So we have things like rain, uh, rainforests, we have uh, redwood forests, we have coastal areas, we have deserts, we have chaparral areas. So we have grasslands, um, you know, we have oak savannas. So all these very different places, these ecosystems um, really interact with our uh, unique uh, number of, of native bees that we have. And it's important to use native plants because um, native plants are mostly used by native insects and insect species are declining worldwide. Um, in some places in the world, they've declined 70% and insects kind of run the world. Um, and so we really need to support uh, that biodiversity. With plants, plants are the beginning of everything, literally. So we take energy from the sun Okay, and I call this my photons to protein slide. Um, those photons get converted by plants into food that other things like caterpillars eat. And then those caterpillars are the protein. And that protein is how other species like birds that can then access the sun's energy. They can't get it any other way. So to pass efficiently the sun's energy um, use native plants. Um, as a rule, native insects only eat the native plants that they evolved with. Um, and again, the pollinators play the key role in the environment, spreading that genetic diversity of plants in the environment. Um, even though plants are decorative, their actual function, remember as a designer, I'm all about the function, plants are food. So that means when you plant native plants in your rain garden, um, you will attract insects and native pollinators. 
guaranteed this will happen. You will have these animals coming because this is a buffet that you're setting. And uh, when I choose plants in nurseries, I always look for the ones that are chewed on that already have a butterfly as a little larva that I can take home. Why is it important to see native plants as food? Um, because you are using native plants. Okay, remember these are foods. So think about a salad bar. Think about a salad bar with you know, iceberg lettuce and maybe some tomatoes, as opposed to maybe a salad bar with maybe three kinds of spring mix, cherry tomatoes, boiled eggs, bacon bits, you know, a bunch of good stuff. Um, everybody's gonna flock to that. Same with the plants. And so because you're inviting all these beautiful creatures to your garden, you don't want the garden then to become something that's called an ecological sink or a trap. And that is something in the environment that attracts organisms like a buffet. And because of this attraction makes it easier for them to be killed through predation or other means. So it's like, well, I'm enhancing biodiversity, but all these insects are coming and dying. We don't want that. Think of bees then as like farmers whose function is in the environment is to spread that gen genetic diversity for other insects to eat. So I'll talk about ways to avoid uh, having an ecological sink or trap um, once you have these things. It's not enough just to plant them. Um, we have to be sure that we're um, optimizing those, those plants. Um, in your sequence of plant selection, remember I said, start with large plants first, trees and shrubs, um, then perennials, fit in as many trees as possible. Trees like to have their roots intertwined. They like to communicate with each other and they will support each other from blowing over if they have a strong root system. They will communicate using that mycorrhizal network underground. Um, your shrub layer then should be about 60% of the other plants and you wanna focus on evergreen shrubs, the ones that don't lose their leaves all at once. And then in your remaining spaces, fit in as many grasses, perennials, bulbs, and succulents and ground covers and vines as possible. Aim for a mix for herbaceous and woody perennials, herbaceous perennials being the ones that die back and disappear, but then come back again. Um, and you know, you don't have to do it all at once. Start with your big stuff first and then add things over time because you it takes time to uh to fill up the buffet with all the good things. And while you're waiting for things to grow in, use annuals. Um, annuals, the seeds that you spread in the garden, they grow and flower and go to seed and they're done in a year. Um, they provide cheap and easy color um, and provide uh, a lot of pollinator resources as well as resources for birds. And they can also fill up the seed bank in the soil so that you'll have these coming back year after year while you're waiting for your shrubs to get bigger. This is a garden I'm working on in my own neighborhood. Um, and I sprinkled these wonderful tidy tips there. And these have been a magnet for both seed eating finches as well as bumblebees and leaf cutter bees. And um, it's just been incredible to see this uh, evolve. Now at the bottom of your rain garden, um, you can plant species that don't mind being in water for short periods of times. Grasses like this Linus condensatus that we have here is nice. And then on the slopes of the garden, plant species that are lower water use, but don't mind a little extra. And then on the outside areas, then plant low water use trees, shrubs, and perennials. Um, and the things that are at the bottom of the garden will appreciate, the rain garden will appreciate uh, the uh, being inundated a little bit. Uh, during the winter. Now maintenance. Um, how do you take care of these gardens once you have the, them in and you keep adding plants? Mostly your most of your work because native gardens are actually really really low maintenance and I know because I take care of five of them and I design them to be low maintenance. Mostly what we do is weed, keep the weeds out, um, you want to irrigate to establish your plants. Um, and the way that you irrigate is you want to encourage the roots to search for water. So don't water straight on top of the root ball, but maybe just outside of the root ball so that those roots then are going down into the soil and finding 
uh, the water. Prune sparingly. You don't have to fertilize. I amend very sparingly when I put mulch down. I, I put it down um, more thickly in some places, but thinner in other places, um, because some bees, 70% of native bees nest underground, so I want to have some bare dirt. Uh, but I do mulch to control weeds outside of the rain garden um, and swale areas to help establish the plants and to kind of um, keep the soil cool and moist. And then if I have trees that generate a lot of leaves, I use those for mulch. Leaves are ecosystem gold. Um, if people don't like the look of that, I suggest a thin, a thin layer of bark chips on the top. Um, if you do mulch inside the rain garden, use bigger chunks of bark chips that don't float away. We don't want those to be washed away. Um, you know, again, leave some bare areas uh, of dirt for, for nests for those bees that will actually uh, tunnel underground and, and have their babies under there. You don't want to use leaf blowers in planted areas. Um, this is one of those ecological trap things. So let's say you've got a nice tree planted that drops leaves and you have a gardener come in and blow those away. You've just blown away a bunch of caterpillars that could have fed birds and that's where your spring butterflies are going to go. So leave the leaves. This is what I mean by low maintenance. Don't worry about cleaning up the garden. Leave your leaves. Um, you know, and but if you do want to use a, a blower to clean up the swale or the bottom of the rain garden, then use an electrically powered blower because that reduces fumes. And fumes are not good because uh, they, you know, carbon dioxide, but um, the smell is um, distracting for insects that use smell to find resources. So um, don't use herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides because those get into the soil where 70% of those bees are nesting. And then occasionally inspect the rain garden and the swale leading into the rain garden for any sort of debris. So pretty easy to take care of. Um, again, avoid creating an ecological trap. If you're using native plants, you will have pollinators coming to those gardens. It's a guarantee. Um, and so the goal then, remember form following function, think of the function, you've got your buffet, you don't wanna kill off your guests to your buffet. Um, with the abundant blooms and nectar and pollen for bees and host plants for butterfly and moth, moth larva, it's gonna be really attractive to these. Um, and you don't want your garden to be something that is unfit to maintain them. Um, if you have two planting beds, connect those, maybe with a planting strip. Reduce light pollution at night. Super easy thing to do is to use blackout curtains um, or put blackout fabric underneath of your, your curtains. Um, super cheap by the yard. Um, you can, on your out, outdoor lights, you can put those on motion sensors or use yellow lights that don't attract insects as much. Um, Again, leave the leaves because insects that become pupa or larva overwinter in leaf litter. That's where actually bumblebee queens like to hang out before they start their colonies all over again. One of the places that they really like is to be in oak leaf litter, which is ecosystem gold. Um, so, you know, save the leaf blowers for the hardscape, but leave the leaves in place and let things live there. Um, now, again, Reduce your use of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, because 70% of those native bees are, are nesting in the ground and those chemicals get into the soil and their development, the babies, is affected by those chemicals. Um, and that's not a good thing. So again, try to reduce uh, gasoline exhaust as much as possible because the fumes uh, interferes with the the ability for the insects to smell something good, something fragrant, like flowers, where their food is. And a final thought um, on all of this, you know, a rain garden is a really great way to start uh, a native plant garden um, with lots of tasty rebates that are available. But then the more that you do these gardens, among the other ecosystem services that these gardens provide, 
you'll start to see and understand about these interrelationships in nature. And you'll understand like how to start optimizing the productivity of these rain gardens and native plant habitats. And once you start optimizing things and you have butterflies flying through and bumblebees and amazingly beautiful creatures coming in, bird life will increase. That will lead to your, um, to your enjoyment and your, um, just your, uh, your enhancement of your, just your love of, of, the, of nature's natural wonder. And um, that, that's my final thought on that. So I'm going to stop sharing for the moment. All right, so I guess we'll go into Q&A now. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, right now, I only see one question. Um, so if anyone else has anything else to add, please do so now. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started with this first question. Um, so this person's asking, um, they were a little bit confused. Um, this is in regards to rain gardens. Um, I guess the images you were showing look more like rock gardens. They're asking if the water is channeled into a rocky swell, where do the plants grow? Um, they don't see many plants growing in the rocky swells, just a few sporadic grasses. And um, they're wondering how that works. Right, uh, so the pictures that I showed with the, uh, the cobbles, we, we definitely wanna put um, cobbles in the swale to prevent erosion. And there were a few plants planted in between the, the cobbles in that one sort of kidney shaped designed one. Um, and they're really, the, the grasses that we have there will get bigger and they were sort of encroaching down into the garden. And over time, we will be adding more um, plants in there. But because these gardens are dry most of the year, um, <laughs> um, having gravel at the very bottom provides uh, visual interest um, if you don't have a lot of plants to start with. Um, and so, I mean, those the pictures that I did show basically were uh, recently installed this year. And so um, have just a few things to start with and um, things will be added over time. But you can totally plant up the bottom of that area with grasses and other things like that like to have a wet, um, wet root area. And when you do that, um, you can like remove rocks, plant something in there. Um, you know, the less plants, it's gonna be a little bit maybe less maintenance to start with, but um, you can totally plant up the bottoms of those. Um, and they don't have to be cobbles in the rain garden. You can totally have like, it can be all grass. Um, and eventually those will be uh, filled up with grasses and things like that. Um, but yeah, no, I don't mean to confuse people, but there are so many different ways to, to do the bottom of a rain garden, um, you know, People want cobbles because they just, they're kind of pretty to look at, I guess. I prefer to see more plants. So, um, you know, it's a back and forth with clients and I will be, uh, we'll be adding more over time, but yeah, it could be completely grass. And sometimes you can even do like a grassy um, indentation um, with some of the, the bigger grasses and sedges and things like that. So uh, no reason to have cobbles uh, completely over the bottom. Um, a lot of people do have them because, you know, that just, they like the way it looks. Okay, so we just got a couple more questions in, so that's great. Um, we'll move on to the next one now. Um, someone's asking if you could touch upon irrigation, um, what's needed as you establish new plantings, and how do you avoid killing existing trees? Okay, so um, what... I like to do when I'm establishing native plants, um, initially, I will water them by hand about once a week, um, a deep watering, um, you know, not on top of the root ball, but around the outside. 
and let the water soak in because the water is going to go down and the roots are going to follow the water. And the deeper they go, the more water they're going to find. And that's what you want to encourage. I would say water about once a week um, to establish the plants. And then once the plants are established, uh, you, you know, with the right mix of plants, maybe you need to water once every three weeks. So, um, and for the first couple of years, um, definitely you want to, you know, keep the plants watered and, you know, support their growth and everything. But what you really want to do is encourage those roots to go down. And some people actually like to, to stress their plants a little bit so that they start looking for water. Um, and the calscape.org uh, website has a really great resource that talks more in depth about irrigation um, and how to sort of mimic uh, natural water sources uh, for these plants to get them to really establish well and get those roots deep into the ground. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, um, could you clarify where we should not remove leaves? Is that anywhere there in soil? Yes. Is that anywhere there is soil? Sorry. <laughs> So uh, I like to leave leaves underneath trees where they fall um, because trees, especially, let's take the, 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 uh, the valley oak, for example. The valley oak is an insect factory. And what happens is that butterflies and moths will lay their eggs on the leaves and you'll end up with a caterpillar. And if it manages not to get eaten by anything else or have some eggs laid into it for waspy things and nasty things happening, they will drop to the ground and go into that leaf litter underneath a tree, directly underneath a tree. Definitely want to keep the leaves there because um, that's how it works. That's the actual function of the tree is to, you know, it has a leaf litter and then the leaf litter gets in, helps the mycorrhiza in the soil. Um, you know, I tell people get the leaves off of the driveway, off the walkways, off the patios out of the gutters, off the roofs. Um, but I generally just leave them where they are. Um, people say, well, you know, what about the plants? The plants will grow up through leaves. This is, you know, they want to live. And so um, I just leave in our gardens that we have, I, it might look unsightly, but um, even seedlings will grow up through leaf litter over time. Um, and you won't see any of like, any of those leaves again, because things will eat those leaves and uh, the detritivores, the ones that eat junk and trash, uh, will eat the leaves and uh, all kinds of interesting things happens in leaf litter. So I always tell people, leave the leaves wherever you can. Be lazy about picking up leaves. Really don't stress about where they are. Don't worry about the plants getting smothered. Um, you know, they, things will grow up through them. But the hardscape, totally fair game. You want to clean that off. For bare soil, um, <clears throat> what I have noticed about um, bees nesting underground is that they really like to nest at edges of rocks. Um, so if like you have two boulders that have like a little separation between them, they will go under there. So I try to leave as much clear area around boulders as possible so that they can get in there um, and, you know, or leave very little leaves in those areas. Um, you know, and when I mulch in those areas, it's like literally half an inch thick so that they can get down to the soil. Um, and, but, you know, insects are resilient. They're gonna figure out a way to get through that mulch. So don't make it too thick. Don't worry about where the leaves are. Um, you know, if you have a sunny spot, um, that is uh, maybe east facing, um, gets sun most of the day. You might want to leave a nice little patch of, of open dirt there um, for for creatures to get into the into the soil. They like to have their nest entrances warmed up because they don't have any really other way to uh, regulate their body temperatures other than with the warmth of the sun. Um, so, you know. So be lazy with the leaves. I give everybody permission not to use leaf blowers because the plants will do just fine. 
Um, but then, you know, just observe, try to see where, if you can see where bees are, are nesting and you will see them, um, you know, and then just try to work around them. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, do you need a permit to build a rain garden and about how much would that cost in Palo Alto? Um, a range or a minimum would be fine. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, you do not need a permit, uh, but you do have to follow the regulations, uh, the codes, you know, five feet from the property line and three feet from the sidewalks and stuff. Um, unless you're digging up, there's a certain amount of soil that you're digging and if it's like a thousand cubic yards, I forget, it's some, some number, but that's on the Palo Alto website, um, then you probably do need a permit for that kind of uh, grading. To, to occur cost. Um, so it really depends on um, your site, but, you know, I mean, I would not recommend, you know, people say, well, you know, uh, to get the rebate, you need a, a contractor to do it. So the contractor is going to give you a price um, and it, it really varies depending on materials. So like if you're going with you know, underground pipes to a rain garden rather than a, a downspout swale, that's going to add cost. I, I really couldn't say exactly what, what ha what's helpful is that when you have your design, give that to a contractor and have them give you a price. Um, and then that gives you a, a starting place. And then you can maybe get two other contractors and get prices there to, um, kind of see where the best price is for those things. But it, it just really depends on what, what your design looks like. Okay, thank you. And I also saw that um, Pam responded um, regarding the permitting. I'm not sure if everyone can see the responses in the Q&A box. So I just wanna read it off for anyone who is curious. Um, most, um, so Juanita was correct. Uh, most rain gardens will not require a permit. Um, for the city of Palo Alto, um, but if you are doing a project that's more than 100 cubic yards, um, you will need a grading permit. And if you have any questions to contact our development center, um, again, their phone number is on our website, their contact information is on our website. Um, but if you have a pen handy, their phone number is 650-329-2496. So thank you, Pam, for clarifying. Um, we'll move on to the next question now. Um, that is, what is the difference between a native planting area and a rain garden? Is the main difference the rocky, usually swale? Um, so the main difference between a native plant garden and a rain garden uh, is the collection of water you know, or the direction of water um, from impervious surfaces down into a place where water can then soak into the ground, um, which is a great feature to have in a native plant garden because that will help the roots to find that water of those, of those features. Um, a native plant garden doesn't have to have a, a rain garden. It doesn't have to have a place to capture water like that. That's made the major difference. So a rain garden can be a native plant garden, but a native plant garden doesn't have to be a rain garden. A rain garden is some, somewhere where you're catching water and directing it so it goes down into the ground. Um, but if you're trying to mimic the way that nature works, and if you're using native plants, it's a great way to uh, put those two things together because they do work optimally very well together like that. Um, and it kind of it mimics the way that native plants, um, some of them work in the environment where they have some lateral roots that spread out as well as tap roots and those tap roots pull up the groundwater and spread it out. Um, but yeah, so because that that's the difference. It's like they can be together, but they don't have to be. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what do you suggest for maintaining trees that are established, but not native and not drought tolerant? 
Uh, well, um, a, a good arborist is going to be helpful for maintaining non-native trees. Um, you know, I mean, the reality is, is that we have a lot of non-native trees in Palo Alto. Um, and what do you do? Um, so trees have a lifespan. Um, and so I start thinking about the future, um, especially when these non-native trees kind of get towards the end of their lifetimes uh, and they look bad. Um, you can start planting underneath of them with something that will take the place eventually, maybe a valley oak um, or something like that, that will take some time to grow. Um, you know, so take a look at your, your non-native tree, decide you know, where it is in its lifespan. Is it like middle age towards senility sort of age of the tree? Does it look crappy and it's like all gnarly and like branches cut in bad ways? Um, and start thinking about the succession of the tree canopy and how you can work some things in. If it's gonna be there for another 50 years, then I would say, you know, take care of the tree the best way that the arborist recommends, but try to cram in as many natives that will fit underneath that tree as possible. All right, so it seems like we have one more. Um, they're asking, what are some good lawn alternatives that would provide some food, even habitat, um, but that are no more than four to six inches high? So one of the, the plants I like to use instead of lawn is to use uh, Achillea millifolium, otherwise known as yarrow. And they do get a, a bloom spike that goes up about a foot. Um, but when it's done blooming, you can just snip it off and you can walk on it. Um, it tends to like a little bit more shadiness and a little bit more moisture. But I like it because um, it kind of forms like this matrix in the ground because of the way it spreads by runners. And you can actually plant within it so that other things will come up through it. And so you get this very natural sort of meadow look, um, but it really is a, is a great lawn substitute. Now, if you're looking for lawn lawn, um, you can do a, a native sod blend. There's a company called Delta Bluegrass that uh, provides native sod blends. If you want the look of a traditional thing, um, but you know, I'm slowly transitioning the area where my lawn used to be into um, a yarrow uh, matrix, I guess is the best thing I could call it, where I, I have yarrow started and then I have stuck in a, a variety of things from annuals to um, geophytes, the bulbs, the native bulbs that will grow up right through the yarrow. This is why I say leave the leaves because really plants will grow up through other things. Um, and that provides, you know, just a nice green sort of a backdrop for it. And these plants support each other. So um, yarrow is a good place to start. And then you can start tucking things into it and kind of getting like a tapestry effect in a very natural meadow looking thing. Bunch grasses are really great. Um, a lot of our native grasses have these really deep root systems. I mean, like 10 feet deep root systems um, that are great because one of the things that those do is they channel water down and help uh, provide, you know, groundwater as well as supporting other plants. And our native grasses, the bunch grasses, are a bunch of, bun get it, bunch of different bunch grasses. No? Okay. Um, that also provide larval food for skipper butterflies. So, you know, why wouldn't, if you like little tiny butterflies fluttering around, um, those are another great thing to put in as well. So lots of choices that are grass-like and lawn-like um, that will work, but yarrow, yarrow is your matrix. Yarrow is the matrix of, through which other things can, can grow and you can get a really nice natural look that way. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions for now. Um, so just a reminder for everyone who's still on with us, um, this is being recorded. So we will be sending out a follow-up email with the recording and it will also be available on the City of Palo Alto website as well as Bosco's website. 
um, and we'll be including some resources to share with all of you um, in that follow-up email as well. Um, if you have any other questions though, feel free to still drop them in the Q&A box down below. But I think for now, we'll move on to the next portion of the presentation. And thank you, Juanita. Your presentation was wonderful and very informative. Um, but now we'll be discussing rebates, specifically landscape and stormwater rebates available to Palo Alto residents. Um, if you do live in Santa Clara County, you can definitely stick around to listen as well. Um, most of these rebates are also offered through Valley Water. Um, which is formerly known as the Santa Clara Valley Water District, and that is available to all um, Santa Clara County residents. Um, the pricing that is available might be slightly different if you're not a Palo Alto resident, but feel free to stick around and um, hear what offerings we do have. Um, oh, I do see one more question coming in last second. Um, <laughs> we'll go over this question before switching over to the rebate um, presentation. So this question is, uh, do plants around the rain uh, depression get water from it or is it functionally separate for all plants other than the grasses in it? Uh, well, it really depends on what kind of plants that are planted around it um, and whether they have the deep root systems, the lateral root systems um, and how much, how much rain we get. Um, so, um, my, my first guess would be probably they do get some of the water from there. Um, because like I mentioned before, the, the more plants that you have in the environment, the more that they are going to share resources and support each other. Um, you know, it, plants like to be in a community, trees like to be in groups. Um, you know, the roots will intertwine underground and it, forms a very resilient network under there. Um, so, um, you know, depending on how long it, it would take for the, the rain garden to be established with plants along the bottom, um, those plants will be sharing uh, with other plants that are nearby. So in a sense, you could say that, yes, uh, the plants, even if they're not directly touching uh, the water that is in the rain garden itself or the moist soil they're in, um, the way that plant roots work and the mycorrhizal connections between them, they will be sharing moisture, um, which is super cool because you know it's this really great community um, that they kind of figure out their own, the plants kind of figure out their own levels of interactions. So um, one resource gets spread out which is nice. Okay, that's all with the questions for now. Um, I'll let you know if any more pop up over the next few minutes because sometimes we have some last minute questions. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen now so that we can go through the presentation about the rebates available. Um, I'm going to invite Joanna to present with me. Um, she will be covering the stormwater rebates and I will be covering the landscape rebates. So let me just get this set up. Hopefully you all can see my screen now. Um, so like I mentioned, we'll be covering the landscape and stormwater rebates. Um, this first is not necessarily a rebate, but more of a program that's available to residents, um, like I mentioned, all throughout Santa Clara County. Um, Valley Water does water-wise surveys. Um, they do indoor and outdoor surveys. The indoor survey is a step-by-step do-it-yourself kit to check for leaks and to evaluate, you know, do flow tests to see if um, you could use faucet aerators, um, or use a different, more water conservative uh, shower head. Um, they also do outdoor evaluations. So basically one of their experts will come out and um, check your irrigation system, uh, make recommendations for upgrades. Um, they'll also, you know, if you're interested in going over your landscape, they will provide some feedback and um, get you pre-approved for the landscape rebate program as well. 
Um, that you would have to set up an appointment with them though. So definitely give them a call ahead of time. Um, another landscape rebate that is available through Valley Water is the Gray Water Laundry to Landscape Rebate. Um, this program or this project is a little more particular um, in the sense that you have to have um, more accessibility. Your uh, clothes washer actually needs to be near an exterior wall. So there is um, a little more restrictions in terms of being able to install a system like this. Um, but if you do, if you are interested in something um, like a gray water system, uh, they do offer a rebate for Santa Clara County, it's $200. Um, but if you are a Palo Alto resident, the rebate is actually $400 because we cost share with Valley Water on this program particularly. Um, so if you want more information, you can definitely go to valleywater.org. And um, as you can see here in the slide, um, Justin, he's one of the employees there at Valley Water. He has a very informative video to go over how to install a gray water system if you're interested. Um, so this is one of Valley Water's most popular um, rebate programs. It's the landscape rebate program. It covers um, not only landscape conversion, um, like we mentioned throughout the presentation tonight, but it also covers irrigation equipment upgrades and inline drip irrigation as well. Um, right now for single family homes, if you were to convert your landscape from a high water use landscape to a more drought tolerant um, landscape, you would get $1 per square foot if you're in Santa Clara County. However, if you are a Palo Alto resident, um, we do cost share with them on this as well. So you would get $2 per square foot. Um, they currently have a cap at $3,000 for um, the total amount of rebate that you could get for the landscape conversion. And um, I do want to mention um, that Valley Water is increasing this rebate starting in July of this year. Um, I actually spoke with them today and they will be, uh, if you're applying now, they will give you the option um, if you are able to hold off on your project until July um, to let you postpone your rebate application until then, just so you can get the higher rebate amount. And they are also increasing the rebate cap by $1,000. Um, so keep an eye out in July, they will have an update on their website and we will have an update on our website as well um, about the increase in price that is available through that rebate. Um, the inline drip irrigation, that is 25 cents per square foot for converting overhead sprinklers to an inline drip. And then um, irrigation equipment upgrades, this covers a variety of um, different um, irrigation equipment. Um, and the pricing for the rebate is different depending on the item that you are um, purchasing or installing. Um, some of these include high efficiency nozzles, um, rotor sprinklers, rain sensors are a very popular one, um, a flow sensor or landscape meter, and then a weather-based irrigation controller. Um, so these are just an outline of some of the offerings that we have. And I'm going to pass it over to Joanna to talk a little bit more about rain garden rebates and some of the other stormwater rebates that we have available in Palo Alto. Thanks, Shelby. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and hop into our stormwater rebates. The first one that um, our group offers is rain garden rebates. Um, so for this particular rebate, you could receive $2 per square foot for every roof area that's diverted up to a maximum amount of $600. Um, we do have some requirements for this rebate. You must have a minimum roof area of 100 square feet and this also must be installed by a licensed contractor. So for rain garden rebates, uh, this is also in partnership with Valley Water. So once you go onto our website, you would be directed to their application portal where you would complete your application and review their terms and conditions. Next slide. In, ad in addition to rain garden rebates, we also offer three other stormwater rebates as well. The first on our list here are for rain barrels. 
For rain barrels, you can receive a total amount of $70 per barrel. The rain barrel must be between the sizes of 40 and 199 gallons. And this is actually our only rebate that you can actually self-install. However, uh, you must apply first prior to purchasing any materials or installing this uh, project. Uh, next on our list are for cisterns. Cisterns, you could receive a total rebate amount of $1 per gallon with a minimum size requirement of at least 200 gallons or more. For cisterns, you must install this with a licensed contractor as well. And similarly to the rain garden rebate, uh, rain barrels and cisterns are also in partnership with Valley Water. So you would complete the application through their portal as well. And last but not least, we do offer a rebate for pervious pavement. For pervious pavement, you could receive a total rebate amount of $1.50 per square foot with a minimum size requirement of 100 square feet. And this must also be installed by a licensed contractor as well. For our previous pavement rebate, this is actually the only rebate that we offer that's not in partnership with Valley Water. So you would complete this application through the city itself. Next slide. And all of the information that I just reviewed is available on our website, which is cityofpaloalto.org slash stormwater. For the rebates that are in partnership with Valley Water, please review all of their terms and conditions and requirements when applicable. And uh, for all of the rebates, please follow each criteria type carefully and review all of our terms and conditions. And the most important point to take away is that you must apply for your rebates before you start your project. And again, um, all of this information is on our website. And then next slide. And last but not least, I do want to highlight an upcoming webinar that we have on Tuesday, May 18th. This upcoming webinar will cover per, uh, pervious pavements. We'll have an expert come in to talk about the various types that we offer uh, for both residential and commercial installation projects and what you need to know before uh, installing this onto your property and what you need to do to maintain it once it's installed. So again, uh, this webinar is on Tuesday, May 18th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. You must register for this webinar. Uh, all information is available on our website. You could visit our previous pavement portal um, once you visit our website and um, we'll direct you to the Bosco website to register. And next slide. I think that was actually it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Shelby to wrap up. All right, thank you, Joanna. And thank you, Juanita, again, for your presentation. Um, let me just make sure there's no more q and It looks like we are good. Oh, just kidding. One just popped up. Okay, let's see. Um, this person has a rental house in Palo Alto that has a front lawn area. Um, for the past five or six years, the tenant stopped watering the lawn, so it's mostly dead. Um, they're thinking of replacing it with low water, low maintenance landscape. Does the situation qualify for the rebate? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, yes, that would still qualify for the rebate. Um, like Joanna had mentioned for um, the stormwater rebates, it's the same thing with the landscape rebates. When you contact Valley Water, make sure that the lawn, even if it's dead, is still there. Because if you start the project before they come and do the pre-inspection, um, you may not qualify anymore. So be sure to just call them, even if it's something you're thinking on doing down the line, you can just call them now and have them come out um, just so you can start the project whenever you're ready, but you will have to get that pre-approval and it's totally fine if the lawn is dead, um, as long as it's not a mound of dirt, I'm pretty sure um, it would qualify and they'll go over, you know, plant selection and, you know, suggestions and provide resources to you during that pre-inspection. Um, let's see, I think, uh, which number should you call? So Valley Water's phone number is, um, it's actually their water conservation hotline and they, this is for the landscape rebates specifically. The stormwater rebates, you will contact um, City of Palo Alto Public Works team. 
Um, but for the landscape rebates, particularly, you will call Valley Water and their water conservation hotline is 408-630-2554. You can also get their contact information on valleywater.org. Um, and one thing I would like to mention about um, when you do call for um, any of their services or the rebates, um, do it leave a voicemail if they do not pick up. Um, they told me to let residents know that um, in case they are out in the field at the time that you call, um, they will give you a call back once they're available. Um, I actually, let's see. Okay, that looks like all of the questions. Um, do they have an email? So I believe their email is uh, conservation at valleywater.org. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty confident in that <laughs> um, just because I've emailed them so many times. But um, once again, just check valleywater.org. There is a saving, saving water tab and that's where all of the rebate information and contact information for each rebate um, will be listed on that website. Um, so I think that's all for now. If there's any last minute questions, I'll go ahead and wait a few seconds um, to let you type it in. Um, I'll just give everyone a reminder um, for those of you that are left. Um, once again, we will be recording this, so it will be available on our website and we will be sending a follow up email with all of the resources and um, link to the recorded webinar um, online. So keep an eye out for that in about a week or so. Um, once we have all of the resources put together, we'll send it out to you. Um, Thank you all for attending and we hope you have a great rest of your night. Thank you.